I'm Dr. Max Gomez, and on behalf of the Cura Foundation and the Worldwide Network for Innovation in Clinical Education and Research, although otherwise known as WNICER, we welcome you today to a discussion on cardiovascular complications of COVID-19. We have four esteemed cardiovascular disease and inflammation experts with us today, Dr. Michael Farku, Peter Monk Chair in Multinational Clinical Trials, and the director of the Heart and Stroke Richard Loire Center of Excellence. He's also the vice chair for research and professor of medicine at the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. We have Dr. Sasha Gungwardina, assistant professor of medicine in Francis and Kenneth Eisenberg, emerging scholar at the Taubman Medical Research Institute at the University of Michigan Medical School. Also Dr. Peter Libby, cardiovascular specialist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Malincrot Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. And last but not least, Dr. Robert Rosenson, Professor of Medicine and Cardiology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai here in New York. Now, you know, like never before, researchers, scientists, and healthcare providers are racing to develop medicines, strategies, and treatments in the battle to stop the global spread of the novel coronavirus strain, SARS-CoV-2. There's an unprecedented need to better understand the mechanisms that distinguish COVID-19 from other viral illnesses to make sure that we better understand the molecular mechanisms that contribute to the unusually varied pathogenicity of SARS-CoV-2. This will allow us to guide development of biomarkers that identify patients at particularly high risk for cardiovascular complications, and then of course, hopefully design therapies that target the potentially catastrophic complications in COVID-19 infected patients. Our panel will try to shed some light on these unprecedented challenges. And remember, we're still learning. So some of this information may evolve and change as a historic pandemic claims lives and threatens the public health of millions of people around the world. Our focus today will be on the intersection of inflammation and thrombosis and their effects on the cardiovascular health of COVID-19 patients. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to give us a very brief summary of their research area so we understand their interest in COVID-19 and then we will move on to uh, our discussion. Uh, why don't we start with Dr. Rosenson. Robert, you want to give us just a little quick summary? Yes, welcome everybody. My uh, research is involved in uh, lipoprotein uh, abnormalities and inflammation and thrombosis. With regards to COVID-19, I'm serving as the national coordinator for the ATT&CK trial, one of the uh, adaptive design studies that are evaluating anticoagulation therapy in patients hospitalized with COVID-19. I'm also working very closely with Dr. Gunawardena on biocellular inflammatory pathways in the intersection with thrombosis. Very good. Uh, why don't we, as, you, as long as you mentioned Dr. Gunwardina, Sasha, tell us a little bit about your research. Uh, yeah, hi all. Um, yeah, so we're, we're very interested in kind of uh, understanding the immune mechanisms of cardiovascular disease and kind of that in intersection of inflammation and thrombosis, as you alluded to, Max, um, and we're employing nanoparticles and micro microfluidic platforms to to do that both at the bedside and in the lab. Peter, tell us about your uh, research there in Harvard. Yeah, I'm a uh, cardiovascular specialist, preventive cardiologist with a laboratory that investigates inflammation and atherosclerosis in vascular cell biology. Great, and Michael, what's going on up there in the North Country? Well, we've, uh, I've, uh, I'm a cardiologist that has been focused mostly on prevention uh, particularly in patients with cardiometabolic disorders and diabetes. And we've been involved in designing a number of clinical trials to evaluate multiple therapies in COVID, including anti-inflammatory agents. And of course, uh, our uh, involvement with the ATT&CK trial, looking at anticoagulation, as this is a disease that predisposes one to uh, blood clots. Uh, 
uh, both in the arterial and venous. Interesting. Good, good, good. So let's let's get into our discussion here. And, and Robert, let's start with you. I, I know you've been working on the effects of lipid lowering therapy on inflammation and, and thrombogenesis, clot formation um, in your laboratory, as you said, may, uh, was the first to demonstrate that statins reduce those pro-inflammatory cytokine production. It seems like inflammation is kind of the, the uh, final common pathway, or maybe the initiating pathway, rather, uh, to so many of the problems that we're seeing with COVID-19. Yes, uh, Max. There's certain viral illnesses, such as SARS-1, um, COV-1, SARS-CoV-2, and MERS, that incite a very profound inflammatory response. And this inflammatory response serves as a trigger for endothelial dysfunction, also blood clotting, and damage to the small uh, vessels as well. And this is a uniform uh, hypothesis that uh, brings these different uh, aspects uh, together. All of those are, uh, that you mentioned, of course, are coronaviruses. Yes. Um, it seems that in the healthcare field, some of the things that we see first are so-called constitutional symptoms, the malaise, fever, fatigue, cough. Uh, that moves on to lung damage. And is it then after that that we then see some of these cardiovascular uh, effects? Uh, is it kind of in that order? Yes. Um, the uh, COVID-19 uh, symptoms you know, begin with these uh, mild and often indistinct constitutional symptoms followed by lung injury. And at the time of the lung injury, there may be a very profound inflammatory response mediated by these cellular um, uh, proteins uh, called cytokines. And this concept of a cytokine storm, an overwhelming inflammatory response that overwhelms the uh, body's ability to uh, dampen it down leads to tissue injury and some of the very severe uh, complications. We see that uh, in COVID-19 patients, that not only is the lung damaged, but you can get damage to the heart muscle, uh, the kidneys, and other organs as well. So in this schematic from a recent publication in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, we describe the symptoms and the different stages of the disease, the mild disease, the constitutional symptoms, moderate disease, often with pulmonary damage between seven and 14 days, and then some of the more severe uh, abnormalities that can occur uh, later, as mentioned above. But what's important for this discussion today is inflammation and how it ties all these disease states together. And inflammation and its uh, effects on the endothelium, uh, the blood clotting system, the small vessels. And then later we'll talk about how COVID-19 can affect insulin signaling uh, the, um, and result in a worsening in inflammation mediated um, pathways in people that are overweight and those with diabetes. Michael, uh, I know that you've been very interested in, in this. Was the cardiac impact uh, and the blood vessel impact there come as somewhat of a of surprise at, at some point? We really thought of this as primarily a respiratory or pulmonary issue for a long time. And is that then what leads to some of these other or, uh, some of the other organ damage that, that uh, Robert just illustrated in his slide? Uh, um, Max, you know, I think there are two pathways. One is where you have a respiratory illness which increases the demand on the heart and reduces oxygen supply so that you can have um, a situation in which the heart is under stress basically because the, the lungs are, are, are compromised. But there's also a direct hit on the heart, which we've seen with other viruses, well described by the work of Dr. Libby and others in the past, where there is a direct effect on the heart muscle itself. And then of course, an effect on the blood vessels, uh, where, one, where, there, where there are lesions and hardening of the artery and plaque buildup in the arteries, they can become vulnerable as a result of this cytokine storm that uh, Dr. Uh, Rosenson alluded to, and the fact that these lesions can become unstable and cause a heart attack uh, to occur as well. Interesting. So Robert mentioned both uh, the endothelial damage, and you brought up Dr. Libby's name. Peter, I know that this is uh, very much your area in terms of 
uh, the endothelial cells uh, lining all of our blood vessels. Tell us how the virus interacts there and what, what's the impact on the endothelium? Well, you know, all of our blood vessels, uh, be they the arteries that carry the red blood or the veins that carry the blue blood uh, and everything in between, the little vessels that connect those two systems, um, they're lined with endothelial cells. The endothelial cells are the foot soldiers in our uh, defenses against blood clotting and invaders. Um, the endothelial cell has a series of functions in the normal state that really protect us and keep blood in liquid state and are anti-inflammatory and also um, keep our blood vessels wide open. Uh, but the endothelial cells can change their face uh, when they sense danger or injury and they can actually take the opposite set of functions. Uh, they can promote blood coagulation, they can become leaky uh, instead of uh, providing a good barrier, uh, they can lose their uh, way of keeping blood vessels open, and a variety of other changes in their functions. So uh, I think we can actually view a lot of the multi-organ system involvement in COVID-19, including the lung involvement, as an endothelial disease. And the endothelial cells have receptors then that the, that the virus seems to like or attach to? Is that how it does its uh, dirty work, if you will? Oh, I think that uh, most of the activation of the endothelial cells and actually the damage to the heart muscle cells is probably indirect, not due to direct viral infection. We're still learning about this, but we do understand the molecular uh, pathway by which the virus enters cells. And uh, it looks like the uh, lining of our uh, respiratory tract has abundant receptors. But then once you get an inflammatory system revved up, uh, then uh, these mediators, we've heard about cytokines, which are protein mediators of inflammation and immunity, uh, can go and they activate the uh, functions of endothelial cells, which are there to try to protect us in the first instance. So it's kind of collateral damage uh, by, by the immune system after the initial damage? Right, so um, I like to think of a uh, cytokine storm like you have a finely tuned sports car. And if you step on the accelerator to the point where you, you bypass the red line, then you can actually damage the engine. And so um, cytokine storm in the end game of COVID-19 is actually due uh, to our own host defenses being turned against us because we passed that red line. Hmm. Speaking of which, Sasha, since you're working, uh, as I understand it, with uh, some of the uh, immunological impact uh, here, tell us a little bit about, about that. It sounds like perhaps some of our red lines, uh, to use uh, uh, Peter's metaphor, may be a little different for all of us, no? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I think uh, Dr. Libby's analogy is, is quite appropriate, right? I mean, so I think we've evolved these systems and if checked and if uh, in balance, they're actually very beneficial to us. So, you know, to fight the infections, to pr protect us from the dissemination of the virus. But if, if, if too much or if it passes that red line, uh, as Dr. Libby mentioned, um, we, it's that collateral damage and that kind of really the host response that actually leads to a lot of, in my opinion, the clinical manifestations and the morbidity and mortality we see um, in COVID-19. So tell me about how does that though end up leading to this thrombogenesis, all these blood clots that we keep hearing uh, are, are really kind of behind a lot of this damage. So yes, I guess um, from my standpoint, and, and it is early days still, and we're learning a lot about this. So, you know, how I think about the coagulation pathway and this thrombotic kind of milieu we have is it's, it's actually physiologically, it's probably serving to confine and prevent dissemination of the virus. So it um, now when you rev up the immune system though, and, and you're, and it starts to spill over, um, this can actually lead to pathologic thrombosis. So I personally believe that there's a, a few factors driving thrombosis, and that's a heterogeneous phenotype when you look in a patient. Um, and but the immune aspects and that immune endothelial interaction, I think, are critical drivers in COVID-19. So the uh, that's what ends up sort of initiating blood clots throughout the cardiovascular system, uh, or are there sort of specific targets first, and then they get. 
pushed out by the uh, by the circulation? Yeah, so I, I think uh, there's actually evidence that both in the macrovascular thrombosis, so larger arteries, as well as microvascular, uh, you have thrombosis in both of those. And even, you know, we, you know, clinically, we think to think of, um, you know, pulmonary embolism or DVTs, and then the embol embolic phenomenon. But I think in COVID-19, you see a lot of evidence of in situ or in intravascular thrombosis, um, which is kind of that really this immune driven, immune mediated thrombotic, which is an interplay between the endothelial cells, um, barrier cells and the immune system. Hmm. Michael, this sounds like something that's also right up, up your alley there in terms of uh, blood clots and, and the cardiovascular system. Yeah. Tell me what you've been finding out and, and are there any interventions that, that seem to be uh, effective or how do you determine at which point you do interventions? I've heard a lot about D-dimers and anticoagulation and so forth. Take me through that, please. Yeah, well, so what happened in the early days that we learned from China, from Wuhan, was that folks had elevated troponin and D-dimer were those that had the worst outcomes and had the highest incidence of mortality. And when we- Those are markers of, of, those are markers they're, of coagulation. Mark, they're markers of, of, of cell injury and markers of uh, D-dimer being a marker of coagulation. And so then uh, it started to emerge that there was a higher incidence of both arterial on the arterial side that's in the coronary bed, the, the cerebral circulation, as well as in the venous system, lower extremity, deep, deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, that these events were also increased in these patients. And so pe people started to scramble as to how to, to manage this. And so most of the data we have, almost all of the data we have now is observational. So what folks did in large centers, like in New York City, Mount Sinai, where over 5,000 patients were admitted in the Mount Sinai system, similar numbers uh, at NYU and in Montefiore. So New York seemed to be ground zero for the study of, these, uh, of the observation of how to treat patients who came in with COVID positive who were hospitalized. And there were a number of strategies. One was to have no anticoagulation. One was to have prophylactic doses of uh, what we call low molecular weight heparin, where we give an injection to people who are hospitalized mm -hmm. to prevent blood clots in, in, in many patients who are hospitalized, and then studying therapeutic doses of anticoagulation to prevent uh, these events from occurring. And the data that emerged seems to be consistent on one front, that no anticoagulation, so the use of no blood thinners uh, in the patients hospitalized seems to be associated with the worst outcomes of mortality and the requirement to be intubated or worsening uh, clinical deterioration. Um, the data looks like we don't know uh, about therapeutic doses of either heparin or uh, some of the newer agents. Uh, one of them that's studied is called the Pixaban, which are more direct agents than heparin or even thromboprophylactic doses of heparin. Those are under study now and in large clinical trials, both at the NIH level in the United States and internationally. And the largest trial is actually the attack trial led from Toronto by a colleague of Dr. Uh, um, Dr. Um, named Dr. Lawler, Patrick Lawler, who, who worked with Peter Libby in Boston is now with us here in Toronto. And that study, the attack trial has recruited 600 patients is, and is ongoing and is studying the effect of low dose heparin versus high dose heparin. Other trials are also in effect. So we're we're not there for the answer yet, but we have recruited almost a thousand patients internationally and the trials are ongoing. Is the D-dimer level or some of these other markers uh, what you use to determine who needs to be anticoagulated? Yeah, that's a good point, Max. And, and that's been a, a, a bit of contention as well. Early on, we believe that those with elevated D-dimers on admission were the ones to go after, but most of the trials are including all patients with a special look at those who, uh, who have an elevated D-dimer as, as an important subgroup that's being analyzed on interim analysis. Robert, let's go back to the intersection, if, if we can, of, of inflammation and, and some of this other damage, including um, uh, the, the hypercoagulation or coagulability. Um, how important is it to measure some of the inflammatory markers as opposed to uh, some of the uh, coagulation monitors that uh, that Michael was uh, was discussing. How do we work that uh, into our decision making process? 
Lumix are certain inflammatory markers that have been shown to be predictive of mortality in patients with COVID-19. The work from Mount Sinai published in Nature Medicine identified uh, interleukin-6, uh, uh, TNF-alpha, um, as uh, very important predictors and extensive uh, multivariate analysis for identifying people that are going to have a bad outcome from COVID-19. What we're trying to evaluate is what is the link between inflammation and uh, clotting pathways, focusing on the circulating inflammatory uh, cells. Right now, we know that uh, you know, D-dimer is a clinical tool that's often uh, used in the attack trial. We're obtaining D-dimers, but we're randomizing individuals regardless if they have an elevated D-dimer or not. What we found out is that D-dimer is not a robust signal for uh, thrombosis. And we know that uh, D-dimer levels uh, may be uh, increased because of a uh, you know, bradykinin and lung injury, and they may persist for a long period of uh, time after clinical resolution of uh, COVID-19. We've also learned from a study of hospitalized patients in the United Kingdom that uh, an integrated measure of uh, clotting, um, the viscosity of uh, the blood, uh, can identify individuals at higher risk for adverse outcomes once they're in the intensive care unit. The blood viscosity takes into account uh, the stickiness of the cells, the acute phase reactants such as fibrinogen, uh, the globulins, um, and uh, other uh, proteins. So you know, we're really learning what would be the best uh, you know, measure. And I think that it's important uh, not just to look broad at the beginning, but also look specific and understand how some of these therapies are affecting the inflammation as well as the thrombosis side of the equation. And there is data with you know, heparin that uh, maybe Sasha can address. Sasha, I guess that, that uh, throws it to you. I want to come back to, to Peter to talk some more about uh, anti-inflammatories, but tell me what, uh, what you're studying there in terms of this anticoagulation. And so, uh, you know, so we're, you know, very interested uh, as everyone with kind of understanding this intersection, right? And so from a diagnostic standpoint, but also, um, you know, how our therapies can be captured in biomarkers and whatnot. So, you know, low, you know, heparins have been used forever. They actually come from mast cells and, you know, with, uh, and have, you know, a profound anticoagulant effect, but they also have an immune modulating effect. And, and, you know, there is some evidence that they, it can um, actually modulate innate immunity and which, which may actually be very beneficial in COVID-19, independent of some of its um, antithrombotic aspects. So, and I think when you start to think about mechanisms linking coagulation and inflammation, um, kind of also a corollary of that is when you start to perturb those systems, what the effects on the other one would be. Um, and I think those are very important. And, and the clinical trials that Dr. Farku is describing, they're critically important to inform how we treat our patients and uh, you know, with this devastating illness. It's interesting that so many of these uh, medications that we've used for some time have uh, multiple effects that, that uh, we, we didn't realize at, at the beginning. Uh, Peter, you mentioned that the endothelium, I didn't want to let this go because I wanted to make sure I understood this. Uh, the endothelial cells themselves may have an anti-inflammatory effect? Yes, our normal resting endothelial cells has a series of functions which maintain blood in a liquid state, which resist the uh, sticking of the white blood cells that are our defense cells. Uh, they normally flow past the endothelium a million a minute and they don't stick. But when the endothelial cell is uh, sensing danger, uh, and we really have a very good understanding of how that works mechanically, um, then it will express these molecules that are like the Velcro that cause the uh, white mm. blood cells to stick. Uh, so while the endothelial cell in its normal state is anti-inflammatory, it becomes pro-inflammatory. That's very important. When you have, let's say you have a, a sliver, um, a splinter in your, your uh, finger, um, you need to mobilize those uh, white cells, those inflammatory cells in order to uh, quell the uh, infection and allow healing. Um, but, you know, it's when uh, those normal functions uh, race away that we, get, uh, that we get in trouble. And I think, you know, you might ask, why is it uh, that when you pass that red line, uh, 
things go haywire? Well, it's because of a phenomenon that actually we described in the 1980s um, in my laboratory and in collaboration with uh, Dr. Charles Dinarello, one of the pioneers in cytokines, and that is that cytokines can induce their own gene expression. Uh, so we have an amplification loop, and it's actually a very effective amplification loop, so you can get this runaway uh, inflammatory response, which leads to a cytokine storm. Um, so uh, this slide simply makes the, the point that all of our blood vessels, uh, be they the red ones, the arteries, the blue ones, the veins that bring blood back to the heart, and the little ones that connect them, the capillaries or microvessels, uh, they all are lined with endothelial cells. Those blue cells on the left are uh, your resting normal endothelial cells that have all these functions that are listed there that are healthy and that help us uh, maintain uh, what we call homeostasis, which is the normal state of affairs. Uh, but when those endothelial cells sense danger, um, they show their opposite face, their Janus-like, and they become um, sticky for the white blood cells. They will cause blood clots and they'll resist the breakup of blood clots with our own clot busters. Uh, they'll become leaky instead of uh, in being impermeant. Uh, they will cause narrowing of the blood vessels instead of keeping them open. And they will uh, release a bunch of things that promote oxidative stress. So the endothelial cell has two faces. And when we have a, an infection and systemic uh, injury, then we elicit those functions from endothelial cells that become the disease themselves if overexpressed. Wow. So it reminds me of the uh, drama, the two faces of drama and comedy that, that we, all, we often see in, in, in the theater. Um, and just so we're clear, obviously uh, our healthcare professionals uh, viewing are, are, uh, know this, but for, for our others, uh, lay people, blood that isn't moving clots, correct? So anything that slows it down or, or keeps it from moving, that's where you're going, going to get blood clots and, and obstruction of anything from not so important blood vessels, if there are, is such a thing, to really critical ones, correct? Right, so Sasha actually has a slide uh, with a picture of Rudolf Virchow, who was the pathologist in Germany in the middle of the 19th century who actually developed what we call Virchow's triad. And that's exactly right. Stasis and endothelial injury uh, were two of the principles in Virchow's triad. And let me, let me uh, maybe ask Sasha to explain that. Oh, I mean, I think, uh, you know, to Dr. Libby's point, I mean, you know, Dr. Virchow's work kind of really been foundational, obviously, for all of us um, in, in healthcare and really kind of as a rubric or a conceptual framework to understand thrombosis and, um, you know, stasis, vascular injury, hypercoagulability, all these factors are actually very prevalent um, in COVID-19, both locally and systemically. And is there, what can we do about it, I guess, is, is the uh, $64,000 question there. Yeah, no, so, um, you know, so obviously this is kind of the, this is where the rubber meets the road, right? I mean, can we understand where this is happening locally? Can we intervene on it? Um, and then the other part with, you know, which we can take from our lessons from acute coronary syndrome, you know, seat coronary artery diseases, when we have a clinical benefit, oftentimes that, you know, that does come at a cost of bleeding as well. So we need, this is where we need Dr. Farku's trials and all these other randomized trials to really understand, you know, that net benefit. Um, and, you know, it's still, I, I think, you know, between therapies, duration of therapies, um, when to initiate, uh, those are all questions that need to be answered and soon. Which is, in a sense, the answer to one of our uh, questions that, that we uh, have coming in, which is why wasn't everybody given anticoagulants early on? And it's a double-edged sword, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, we all want to do what's best and to actively, you know, help our patients. Um, but I think, you know, the, the humility of this and doing this is, you know, we have to understand that we, we don't want to make things worse. So I think you know, using evidence and science to guide us is very important. Michael, I know that you're also very interested in uh, diabetes as well as, as coagulation. Uh, how do those two things interact or, or in, what's the interplay between this? Because we know that diabetics are at much greater risk for adverse outcomes here. Yes, well, the greatest predictor uh, uh, overall of increased risk is obesity. Obesity, is particularly in younger folks with COVID, is predictive of complications and a worse outcome 
compared to those who are lean. And of course, that is associated with diabetes and cardiometabolic disease, where we have resistance to insulin, where in fact, the body produces more insulin than we need, but you're resistant to it. And this is associated with an inflammatory milieu that, uh, that promotes uh, injury and promotes uh, clotting uh, as well. So the idea here is that um, this is one of the things that the message from a public health perspective is that weight is so important in lifestyle right now in terms of reducing your, your weight and exercise is so important as we are in this middle of this pandemic, which may last for many more months. And so the, the whole idea that diabetes plays a role uh, is under study, but it's the underlying predisposition to this inflammatory process, which then worsens as you become infected with COVID, which we're, we're studying. And there actually are studies of anti-diabetic drugs that protect the endothelium uh, that are under evaluation. Uh, and we have one uh, such drug, uh, uh, semaglutide, which uh, is a drug that works to increase, uh, to reduce insulin, uh, to increase insulin levels, reduce inflammation, and it's under study right now. But it's very hard to do these trials to convince patients who don't have diabetes to be in a, in a trial of uh, anti-diabetic therapy. So one of the challenges we have is organizing trials, getting people to be participating in trials, but we're learning a ton about the impact of obesity and diabetes on this disease. And Michael, I recall some research papers uh, now back a couple, a few years back that indicated that obesity and fat cells, they themselves were directly inflammatory or pro-inflammatory without even having to go down the road to diabetes. That, that's right. So you have what's called the metabolic syndrome, which is a, what we call the pre-diabetes phase. And that's where, if you look at the pyramid of risk, many people are in that you know, uh, overweight category, um, early obesity, and have this inflammatory background. So we, can, we need to work on, on prevention and primary prevention is so important to prevent diabetes from developing in the first place. Because we know there's a cliff response. Once you develop diabetes, the complications of diabetes are much more extreme than what we see in the metabolic syndrome. So we have a lot of opportunity in those years of the 40s and 50s when people have metabolic syndrome pre-diabetes to intervene. And that's a message that's come out loud and clear in the COVID era. Peter, Michael mentioned some of these uh... Uh, diabetes drugs may be protective. Is that at the level of the endothelium then? Yeah, they, certainly some of the um, anti-diabetic drugs, uh, some of the more recent ones, which have proven to be beneficial for the cardiovascular system can have effects on the, on the endothelium. You know, we, we have, um, if you go onto the federal website called clinicaltrials.gov, there's more than 3,600 trials in COVID. And some people might think that's a good thing, but I think actually it's um, a mission that we haven't pulled together. And that's why I congratulate the trialists on this panel because they're actually trying to do randomized, placebo-controlled, blinded trials so that we can get ourselves out of this morass of observational data, unblinded data, non-randomized allocation, and really move forward because I'd rather have 200 good studies than 3,600 studies that are scattered like, uh, like uh, gunshot all over the landscape. Yeah, I, re I recall for, at the beginning, it was throw anything you can up at the wall and, and see what sticks. Uh, there were some, some things seemed to work and some things were really kind of uh, a little crazy, I, I think. So your point is actually very well taken. Uh, it's hard to get people to understand that though, that uh, a double blinded placebo controlled trial is really what we actually uh, actually need. Uh, Robert, let's talk about, because we, 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 uh, someone mentioned a little bit earlier that some of these medications, it was Sasha who said that um, heparin may have some other uh, effects in addition to its anticoagulation uh, coagulation effects. Same goes for some of our statin lipid lowering drugs. And I, I know that when I tell people that the effects of statins may be just as important uh, as anti-inflammatories as they are at lowering cholesterol, they, they look at me in surprise. Tell me about, about that and how that's going to interact or affect COVID-19. 
Max Stanton's uh, decrease uh, inflammatory cytokine production from the mononuclear cell, but they also reduce systemic inflammation at the level of the liver. You know, very uh, important, expansive work uh, from uh, you know Peter uh, Libby and Paul Ritger in that regard. The question is whether statins have any benefit in patients with COVID-19, and also, is there any harm of continuing a statin in individuals who often have muscle aches and muscle weakness, that uh, viral illness that uh, results in that myalgia, the muscle ache? And that's a very important and yet unresolved question. But we know from a retrospective analysis of patients hospitalized in Wuhan, China, that uh, the those individuals who were previously treated with a statin versus those who were not had a 25% lower hospital mortality rate. That's a large number. And whether that can be substantiated in other studies remains to be determined, but uh, we're working on that in the Mount Sinai uh, system, which is gonna have a larger uh, sample size, more uh, heterogeneous population in terms of uh, races uh, and um, you know background uh, you know, uh, illnesses. But as Peter appropriately mentioned, that uh, these uh, retrospective analysis never substitute for a randomized clinical trial. And there are five randomized clinical trials of which I'm aware, the last time I looked at clinicaltrials.gov, that are evaluating statin versus placebo in patients hospitalized with COVID-19 to determine whether the anti-inflammatory effects of statins are something that we can use to dampen down that uh, you know, unregulated, uh, out of control inflammatory uh, response. So you know, it's a process in evolution. But one of the comments I'd like to make for you know, our patients is that if you're on a therapy for your blood pressure, such as an angiotensin receptor blocker or a statin for your hypercholesterolemia or just in general, your cardiovascular risk, stay on the therapy you know, because we want to protect people against you know, developing um, a, um, um, a clinical syndrome that's going to be, uh, you know, worsened by the underlying inflammation. Um, and, you know, that uh, is one of the, you know, triggers for what we call a type 1 myocardial infarction that's been observed in some patients with, uh, you know, uh, COVID-19. Certainly, there's other causes of myocardial infarction, the, you know, imbalance of oxygen, the increase, uh, you know, catecholamines or adrenergic stress, that causes supply demand uh, problem, a type two MI. But we also have to be aware that uh, many people are gonna rupture their plaques if they have uh, coronary disease and get a big inflammatory uh, mm -hmm. insult. Statins do work uh, in that situation. Um, in the absence of COVID-19, hopefully they do in COVID-19 as well. Good, good. Sasha, I wanna ask you a little bit about uh, clinical trials, but first I should, uh, I neglected to mention that uh, for our viewers, if you go to the Q&A function, uh, at the bottom there of the uh, of your screen, uh, you can submit some questions, and and at the end here, hopefully we'll have some time uh, to answer some of them. I think we've already answered uh, a couple of them. One was, uh, should all patients uh, with COVID-19 get get blood thinners? And I think Sasha, why don't you repeat the uh, the the answer to that, and then I want to ask you about clinical trials. Yeah, so the short answer, uh, there's actually, you know, for healthcare providers, uh, the New England Journal has actually, uh, I think it's this week, a, a nice kind of case description, and it, it's a, uh, it has point, counterpoint on kind of the pros and cons of it. You know, I, I would say that, um, yes, there's a heightened thrombotic risk, um, but anytime we treat thrombosis or try and reduce the risk of it, there's also a bleeding risk with the existing therapy. So you, you want to do any of this in consultation with your healthcare provider. And I would say right now, there, the evidence isn't there to you know, recommend every patient get treated um, with uh, antithrombotics. It's always risk benefit, right? Tell me about then clinical trials. I know that you're involved with, with a couple of them. Describe them to me and how do you tease out the little different pieces of of COVID-19 here that seems so disparate? Yeah, so, you know, so from our standpoint, we're very interested in kind of the mechanistic drivers um, and how, you know, we can use as, as kind of causal biomarkers to, you know, coming back to your question about who should get heparin or a DOAC, um, if we could, you know, personalize, you know, our therapies to patients more than we can now, 
Um, and, and we believe that understanding the mechanistic drivers will help inform that decision. So we're very interested in trials that have, you know, a therapeutic end um, that we can use to, you know, the attack trial, for example, of heparin in COVID. But we want, we want to do, you know, you have a perturbation, the drug that you're giving your patient, but we want to see how the immune and the coagulation system evolves in response to that drug in tandem with COVID. So that information um, you, where you can study the interactions of these systems and will hopefully inform kind of our, you know, diagnostic and therapeutic strategies in the future for, you know, other infectious agents, but also cardiovascular disease and other kind of chronic inflammatory diseases. So, Michael, it sounds like this is a, essentially a still developing matrix for decision making. Um, I think Robert mentioned D-dimers, inflammatory markers, bradykinin, blood viscosity. Um, that, that's a fairly complicated, it sounds like at this point, matrix for your decision-making tree. Yeah. The clinical trials have been divided largely according to the severity of disease. Uh, we have trials in the outpatient setting, those patients that don't require hospitalization, mm -hmm. then those that require hospitalization on the ward that are not in an intensive care unit or in uh, requiring mechanical ventilation, and then those in the ICU. And, and you know, I think we're going to be able to evaluate therapies based on the best timing of initiating these therapies. We learned a lot about corticosteroids in patients in the ICU, showing tremendous uh, promise that it was an intervention that had effectiveness, which now has been adopted across the world. Uh, but the idea here is that I think by doing the mechanistic biomarker studies, we'll understand which patients benefit the most and we'll understand by these different stages of trials when the timing is the best. And it may be that we'll learn a lot more uh, in the ensuing months about the optimal strategy initiation. And, and I think that'll, that goes across the board, both with anti-inflammatory agents and antiviral drugs, but also with uh, the anticoagulation. And you, you mentioned uh, outpatient trials. And I think that's something that most people aren't that familiar with. The idea obviously is we want to keep people out of the hospital, but it seems like many or most of these trials are for, for the hospitalized and, and most serious patients, but there's, there's a role for keeping people out of the hospital with these trials. Yeah, absolutely. It's harder to enroll the patients and follow them in terms of identification, because when patients come to the hospital, they're held captive in a bed and we can bring our coordinator teams around to visit with them. But we've been very, very strategic in uh, recruiting patients in the outpatient setting through COVID screening centers and through public health initiatives that allow us to reach these patients and ask for their consent, even remotely, without them even having to come to a hospital. And that's been allowed us to, uh, to uh, evaluate certain therapies. Colchicine, which is an anti-inflammatory drug, uh, has, is being studied in the outpatient mm -hmm. setting, as is aspirin and even some of the direct uh, anticoagulants known as, one of them known as apixaban is in the NIH trial. And, uh, and so we're learning a lot about how to do studies effectively in the outpatient setting, which we believe might uh, forego all of these complications if we can initiate the therapy earlier. So I, I have a question here that could be for, for any of you, or maybe all of you want to uh, avoid it. Um, as, as a journalist, I've, I spent the last many months covering vaccines and vaccine trials and so forth. And, and as you all were, were speaking, it occurred to me that a vaccine is going to essentially rev up the immune system uh, and get it to, well, there's a, a variety of different mechanisms, obviously. What's the possibility that a vaccine could increase inflammation, endothelial damage, some of these other things that we're trying, that we know are mechanisms of, of damage in COVID-19 and that we're trying to reduce, could a vaccine work against us? And whoever wants to take a shot at it, please. Well, let, let me uh, start out. Um, so of course, the way that the vaccination actually works is to incite a bit of an immune response that's why your arm aches for a day after you get your flu shot. And that's good because it means that you're educating your immune system to respond to the antigen, uh, which comes from the germ, the microbe, the virus, whatever. Uh, 
but that's uh, almost always localized and short term. And then you've educated the immune system so it can respond when it encounters the invader and pump out uh, antibodies or uh, send our foot soldiers for the immune response, the T lymphocytes to uh, try to uh, eliminate the cells that are virally infected. Uh, so vaccination uh, is net, 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 uh, very positive because we're using the highly educated adaptive immune system. When we talk about the cytokine storm, that's another um, part of the immune or inflammatory system uh, called innate immunity, which is very rapid, but very blunt. You know, it's a very blunt tool. Uh, it's like a sledgehammer, but the vaccines use our uh, adaptive immune response and the education of the immune system to respond to the specific uh, antigen uh, takes time. And it's a real surgical uh, response. Instead of the innate immune system may respond to a thousand different structures, whereas the adaptive immune system actually literally billions of structures. So it's a very, very finely tuned. And I think it's a very important message for the public that we just have not seen vascular complications of vaccination uh, across the board since the uh, introduction of the, the first vaccines with, with uh, very few well-documented exceptions. So, you know, the vaccines are uh, just the pillar of our prevention against uh, viral diseases like uh, COVID-19. I'm not anti-vaccination at all, just to, yeah. <laughs> just to be clear. But, but, but there, there, there may be doubt on, among some of the uh, over 100 people who are listening and I'd like to come out very strongly as uh, someone who understands something about immunity, uh, that this is going to be a big uh, plus. Mm -hmm. So we do know that there is this vaccine enhanced reaction, rare, but we have seen it in, in, some, in some cases. Could that be an issue here? And I'm just asking the question. I know I don't think we've seen it so far in the clinical trials. The, the issue with the, uh, some of the current vaccines that they're using novel technologies, uh, which have not been used before. And that's why it's so important that we go through a methodical clinical trial, particularly because mm -hmm. we're giving the vaccine to well people. Uh, we have to be very certain that we're not doing any harm on any level. Mm -hmm. And so that's why uh, the rush to judgment is gonna be a big mistake. Uh, for example, one of the vaccines mm -hmm. is a RNA vaccine. And actually, that's a first, first in class. And while it's very promising initially, and we all have high hopes, we need to be very careful about the safety side of the equation. But uh, I have confidence that if our scientific community actually is allowed to evaluate under the usual methods that we use, uh, that we'll come up with a safe vaccine and we'll know about the efficacy as well. Thank you. Let me take one, one uh, more question here that got sent in, and then I want to ask each of our panelists for a little take home uh, message so that we get out more or less on time here. Um, it's an area that uh, uh, I am interested in and the Cure Foundation also has always been very interested in is cell therapies and cellular therapies, stem cells, uh, natural killer cells and so forth. Is there a role uh, for that in uh, this COVID-19 therapy, um, they, some of them, some of these cells are known to be anti-inflammatory and so forth. Where, where does that fit in? Uh, and that can be any of you who want to uh, speak up uh, to that. Yeah, there are studies of stem cells that are uh, ongoing um, in the uh, International Stem Cell Research Institute. They've brought to uh, attention in their uh, newsletter some of those trials that have uh, been initiated, but um, sorry, that's uh, an area that's a little bit out of my expertise, but I know trials have uh, begun in that field. Okay, well, we only have a few minutes left. Um, I always like to ask our panelists for uh, a little uh, pearl of wisdom, uh, a take home uh, message here. Um, Sasha, I'm afraid you get to go first. Uh, yeah, um, yes, I guess from my standpoint, I mean, it was a great discussion. I, I think you know, for all um, 
you know, it's obviously, it's, there's a tremendous burden on our healthcare system, you know, our patients and people who this has touched every one of us and our families and friends. Um, but I think that, you know, what you're seeing here with this is that you're having, you know, the scientific community is coming together, you know, there's so much cross disciplinary work and, and, you know, hopefully we can learn from, you know, this, you know, this tragic disease and, and get better and stronger um, for future ones and, and also our communication and our mechanistic understanding. Peter, what do you hope people uh, remember from today's webinar? A year ago, none of us had any idea about SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Yet the scientific community was able to mobilize, to uh, isolate the agent, to sequence it, and to start uh, working on monoclonal antibodies and vaccines and therapeutics, and all within the space of uh, 10 months or so. So how did this come about? It's because we made an investment in basic research. You can never predict the outcomes. Uh, we were prepared for this pandemic because there'd been a very strong public investment in fundamental research uh, where you couldn't necessarily draw a direct line to the consequences. Same thing happened with HIV AIDS that there had been decades of research in viral oncogenesis with retroviruses that prepared us when that plague uh, reared its ugly head to mobilize and understand it in a way uh, that would be much less rapid if we hadn't invested. So my bottom line is we are reaping the benefits of investment in science and let's keep up the belief in science and let's keep up the investment. You know, I couldn't agree more. It, it, it's an important lesson for, I think, all of us to remember uh, when basic scientists get asked, well, what's the point of your research? Now we're seeing where it might actually lead. Uh, Mike, what do you hope people remember from this? Well, I hope they remember that we're all in it together. We've had a tremendous collaborative spirit in the scientific community. I think this has spilled over to the community in general and to all of our supporters who are on the call today and that all of us can do something uh, to mitigate this risk of uh, contracting the disease by social distancing and masking, of course, but also preventing the complications. And uh, I think that the take home message I have for those that have predisposing conditions like obesity, diabetes, or heart mm -hmm. disease, that you continue with your medications, continue with your follow up with your physicians. It will be virtual, likely, more likely in the next few months but don't forget to take your meds and we don't want you, we want you to be on the pathway to real healthy preventive strategies. Um, we've learned over the time, there's been some contention about some of the drugs being stopped or discontinued. We've talked about uh, ACE inhibitors and ARVs, which we could have a whole conversation about that. And the community came together and said, continue your medications, particularly those with heart disease, continue on your secondary prevention strategies. Robert, I know you uh, agree with uh, Mike on that, but wrap it up for us. Max, you know, we've seen uh, terrible consequences of uh, COVID-19 all over the world. And uh, New York uh, suffered uh, tremendously at the beginning with uh, hospital mortality rates of about 25%. We are now using a lot of the therapies that we believe have anti-inflammatory, anti-thrombotic effects. The mortality rate has uh, fallen but people are still suffering. And there may be long-term consequences of the mm -hmm. viral initiated inflammatory response. We need to continue our investment in science with the um, evaluation of very specific therapies that target this intersection between inflammation and thrombosis so we can make these therapies safer and make sure that we're targeting therapies appropriately with very well-defined uh, biomarkers. So. You know, the investment in science is uh, there and everybody in the public should uh, really be supporting uh, the lessons from science. It's an evolving field and we need to uh, embrace uh, the role of the scientists, the healthcare providers, as we're all trying to do everything we possibly can to uh, save lives. Exactly, and, and I think that's one, uh, if I can expand on that for one little bit, is that's a lesson that has sort of been lost is that things that were said back in February, March, April, even last month, as we learn more, may turn out to be either not true or we need to refine it. So um, it is science evolves. It's an iterative process. Uh, we can look that up in the dictionary later.
Anyway, thank you so much, Robert, Peter, Sasha, uh, and Mike for taking the time to be here with us today. Uh, it's been just amazingly educational, I think, for all of us. And it is so critical that we continue to improve in this area, both nationally and globally, so we can learn from one another and improve human health globally. This is a global pandemic. We hope our audience found this conversation informative and we'll be sending you a follow-up questionnaire to get your feedback. So please take the time to share with us your views. We want to improve. In the meantime, stay safe and healthy. And on behalf of the Cura Foundation and the Worldwide Network for Innovation in Clinical Education and Research, thank you for joining our discussion and please wear a mask. Have a great day.